<laughs> Great. Well, thank you for everyone joining us and also for Tom uh, to share some of his stories about his journey building Lithuania's second unicorn, uh, Nor Security. So, Tom, can you start by maybe telling us what it was like in terms of the environment as a founder in, 20, in 2012 when he started Nord? Yeah, so, um, hey guys, excited to be here. Um, well, you know, we started uh, uh, well before that together with uh, my fellow co-founder, Amos, he's also here. Um, so, you know, we've been doing many things until uh, we found Nord, we are counting that um, we've done maybe 30, 34 uh, projects before. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, my background is I was working in an ISP and um, um, Amos' background is, you know, working in uh, marketing and we saw that privacy uh, and security is becoming uh, a thing. And, um, you know, internet uh, was designed to be a, a place where uh, you know, it's a global thing, created thing where people can access. It shouldn't belong to anyone, and, uh, on, and it should be also safe and not, you know, a place where everyone is uh, scared to be online or get their picture stolen or have to pay money for their data to get it back. Right. So um, we thought that, um, um, and and the idea behind the internet is. Uh, um, when, you know, Sir Term Berners-Lee created it to create a uh, World Wide Web, um, that it has to be free and open. So um, that's why our mission is to create a radically better internet. And in 2012, um, we've uh, started uh, NordVPN um, out of Lithuania. Um, yeah, we launched first uh, servers, uh, servers, we launched everything on uh, WordPress, our websites, and yeah, and we started selling uh, our services and products to, to our users. Was there even a conversation about at that time, should we try to find investors? Should we try to find a way to raise seed capital? How did you, how did you get that ball rolling? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, you know, uh, we knew what, uh, what we want to do, and uh, um, I've checked the stats before. It's um, like in 2012. It was uh, 54 million uh, only dollars invested in all Baltic ecosystems: Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Um, and this year is 2.4 billion. <laughs> so basically, it's a dramatic shift for the market. Um, and um, um, we just, you know, there was no access uh, to capital back then. Uh, everyone was focused um, um, elsewhere. But also, we immediately started, um, you know, selling a premium product. Um, so basically, we started getting revenue um, at the at the beginning. Um, and uh, yeah, somehow we, we think that we have investors and we had investors and these investors are our customers. So we call it, you know, customer finance to growth. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we've got lucky and excited category grew um, and we boost up the, uh, the business up to today. That's great. I think for many founders at that time, certainly in London or England, the conversation would have been, do we need to move closer to Silicon Valley? Do we need to go to the Valley to raise or do we need to move the business either to New York or San Francisco in order to have the founders there? Maybe keep the engineering team in Europe yeah. to have a presence on the ground to be connected to those investors to raise. Was that ever a conversation for you? Um, no, I think uh, well, one of the I think our secret sauce is, and I really advise this to all other founders and um, that, that I meet, that people really want to be part of something that you create in local ecosystem and, you know, pe things that you basically create local but ship global. We're out of a small country of Lithuania. We have, you know, close to 2,000 people and there, you know, majority of them are still in Vilnius or in Konas in, in, in Lithuania. And, you know, when these superstars, everyone, we have so tens of millions of users all around the world that when we see, so, you know, even US celebrities or anyone else using uh, your product that you've created, everyone is proud. And uh, we really have that uh, culture. And I think uh, it really uh, that led us to uh, create products that people love and enjoy. Um, so I'd, I'd say definitely um, 
depends, you know, what you're optimizing. And I never suggest to optimize for, you know, the happiness of investors. I, opt I suggest to optimize for your business and, you know, for product and the kind of uh, the people that you, you're serving. So for that, uh, Lithuania was, uh, was a key to success and is key to success to date. And we had no plans of moving out of there. That's great to hear. Can you maybe share just like sort of what are the challenges in terms of bootstrapping a business? Obviously, you're a digital business, but like you're talking about installing servers, you're running your own VPN network, you need some infrastructure as well. I mean, uh, obviously, mistakes are being made when you're doing this first time, right? And uh, no one knows. I, we don't know. I don't know how to run this big infrastructure of 9,000 servers all around the world, um, how you know everything works. So we learned uh, by doing. Uh, obviously, these mistakes come, but, uh, but uh, also we learn super fast and be you know, agile. Um, in the same time, um, uh, sometimes, you know, network was a problem. Reaching some folks or people all around the world out of Lithuania was pretty uh, tough. Uh, now, you know, after COVID, Zoom became uh, a thing where, you know, a remote video, so you can reach anyone in the world way, way quicker and easier. Luckily, we can be back in conference like this. And uh, uh, so I think there were some um, challenges. But uh, I wouldn't say that uh, without, uh, I mean, there's nothing instrumental that really slowed us down. Um, but, and you know, it's good to have challenges <laughs> always. That's great to hear. Now, if the fund environment was different, do you think you would still bootstraps? Or do you think you would have looked to take on investor capital earlier? Yeah, um, no, I mean, we've been, uh, we've been uh, yeah, fundraising when obviously the markets were okay -ish. Um, And, uh, you know, it all depends uh, at the stage of life and your company and what you want to achieve and what you want to do. Uh, obviously, if you need the uh, cash, so you're going to fundraise whenever, doesn't matter about the markets, uh, whenever the time is right. But uh, if you are... If you are good, um, you're just you know thinking about partners. In our case, we were looking not for money; we were looking for partners, friends that could support us in the next uh, level of journey, and you know supercharge us in some things that were not uh, strong enough. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'd say now um, for the current period, we're good. We're, we've been always been growing in a sustainable way. Um, we're gonna continue doing that. And um, yeah, we're very happy that uh, folks, you know, that join institutional investors and also founders, like 20 founders and friends uh, joined the round. So from here, Mickey uh, from Walt and Ilka from Supercell. Um, so all of them, you know, from here joined, the, joined the, our round and uh, are now friends. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and we're good. We're very, very happy uh, to have them. So. Um, I'd say, you know, depends on every company's journey, um, but uh, it's very easy to get into the hype loop when you see articles all in the, uh, in the news. Everyone gets raises on billion dollar valuations and you want to do so, but you have to think more about the business and not just about the, uh, you know, the cover, how it looks like. So. Mm. I'm curious, sort of how did you sort of balance sort of growth and also sort of maintaining the finances of the company? You know, do you think you could have grown faster? Uh, I think, uh, yeah. So in Europe, uh, or, or uh, I think in Europe, we were much more conservative even throughout the last couple of years. When in the US, it was, you know, you get all the money, uh, and investors and everyone, the mantra was that basically, you get as much money possible, you grow, grow, grow hundreds of percents, you hire so many people, and then you will figure out about the you know, revenue and profits later. In Europe, I think companies and, and businesses were much more um, cool down, right? They were, they were not pushing that hard. So, um, and in our case, nothing, nothing changes. We, we like to grow sustainably. Um, sometimes, you know, you miss the opportunity to grow uh, five times a year. But in the long term, now every market has shifted back to companies like this, where, you know, 50% growth or 70% growth, but being cash flow positive is, is okay back again. But I think this is a big difference. And in Europe, we've been doing this for a while, not just, you know, us, but many companies. And uh, that's why a big shift is much more happening in the US, uh, in my view, in, in nowadays rather than in Europe. 
Can you tell me about the decision? You sort of obviously are very well known for your VPN product, but you've since launched several other functions as well. Yeah. Can you talk about sort of expanding away from like having a core profitable product into new areas? How did you assess those risks and opportunities? Again, it all comes down to our mission. We really want to create a radically better internet. And uh, um, currently, our product suite consists of a VPN, NordVPN. Um, then we have a password manager called NordPass. And then we have a, a cloud storage, encrypted cloud storage called NoLocker. And what we saw, and uh, that VPN basically protects your network. But then we want to protect your identity online with NordPass and passwords, and then also files with NordLocker. And then you know it, we want to create a software where you download, activate, relax, and it works in the background, and a uh, single click of a button, and you enjoy a free and open uh, internet. Um, so I am excited that uh, uh, you know and that uh, it gets really great traction, and customers are adopting it really well. And we started offering the same now for businesses. Um, for small and medium businesses all around the world. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just the next path that we decided to do and go. And uh, now, um, when basically um, you get Nord, you can immediately get uh, all of the products um, at once. That's great. As you started to grow Nord and you started to build traction, you must have got a lot of inbound conversations from investors looking to see if you wanted capital or if they could help you grow. How did you approach those conversations? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a nice dance that you dance, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, um, the reality it takes time, but you have to build a relationship because then you'll understand over time who is the right partner you want to partner up and work with, um, who helps you. Uh, and there are many investors, and kudos to them, um, that helped us, me personally, even though they, they didn't invest, or <clears throat> even the fundraise was not open, but they've been supportive and helping. And you can really get value and you know, learn from them and, uh, um, and you know, get the right questions. And then these questions lead to good answers and good decisions later on. So we've been in touch with many investors along the, along the years, um, but uh, we never got into a kind of a place where we started the fundraise with one or other. And when we were just ready, we kind of uh, kicked off the process, selected, uh, um, I'd say, yeah, 30 firms that we went and talked with. Not, not, uh, not that we didn't go wide, um, that we really liked and we've met over the years. And yeah, and we started those negotiations and talks. Uh, it was not easy. <laughs> it took time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we learned lots of good things. Um, and um, it uh, really is a full-time job. So you founders also is, you know, have to be very careful not to spend too much time on fundraising, because you know, the core is to build product and uh, build great culture. So I think that's even more important than relationship with investors. Can we maybe talk more about that decision? Because in this sort of startup ecosystem, it's very unusual to have a 10-year-old company raising around for the first time almost 10 years of the start of this journey. So like, wh why then? Like, why then did you look to raise that capital? Um, first of all, to prepare for a fundraise is a process that you have to, you know, you have to engage. And it's, again, it will require lots of your time. So we decided that. Uh, yeah, we want to do this uh, this year, um, or you know, end of uh, last year or this year, that we could definitely focus and load up before in any downturn that it might happen. Um, so we've, uh, we kicked off the process, and uh, we really were looking mainly for partners. We haven't, uh, we've got a hundred million investment, and we haven't touched the cash yet. So basically, we're focusing on a, a really long term here, and to add the fundamentals uh, for for the future opportunities and the growth, and not to miss them. Um, I think you can't do a first ever fundraise in, in one month or one week. If it's follow up rounds, that might be a bit easier. But for the first time, it will take time to get to know you, investors. And when you're looking for partners and optimizing for that, um, it, it, it definitely going to you know, uh, require more time. So we've uh, kicked, up the, kicked off the process. And um, yeah, and we found the partners that um, um, institutional investors that are in our core markets are in the US, um, UK, um, Germany, um, and also, again, 20 founders and, and, and friends that joined the, the round, personally as angel investors. 
and yeah, and uh, we did it uh, in a very simple fashion. We even, you know, we had uh, higher valuation offerings uh, from others, but we decided to go with these guys because we thought that's the right fit. They've been super supportive, founders themselves, uh, being built, uh, you know, the same things. So um, we had really good chemistry, and I know you, you know the guys as well pretty well. They're great people, and um, yeah, and, and that's that's how it happened. And we're now yeah working together. I think I saw uh, a couple of them here as well. So um, so yeah, so we we're gonna continue building Is together. There that's great. Is there an adjustment, though, for you as a founder, where you had, obviously, very high ownership, very high control of the Nord? <laughs> to some extent, it's, it's your baby, it's your business. <laughs> Is it difficult now to sort of share that with investors and with the boards, these decisions? Uh, um, no, no, totally no, because they're very, very um, supported. They're very founder-friendly, I mean, and again, uh, Another advice would be that when we've got even higher offers, there were much more governance included. Mm. Um, but uh, with these guys, they trust us. They've been, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years. And uh, we definitely need some help in some areas, but in some other areas, we know, we know the gig and we know what to do. Um, and I, th I think we all agree on this one, and we continue building uh, um, together. Obviously, that uh, uh, there are some more reporting and other things. It, which is also good because you see the you know uh, the identify the weak parts. Maybe you have to look. Maybe as a founder, you wouldn't look at them in a you know on a regular basis every month or every quarter. And it really makes you stop and think a bit and you know answer those questions, which sometimes even you know you don't want to answer or or you don't want to think too much about it because it's hard. So it's really good. It's very healthy, but also it has to be a balance. It's, you know, for other founders that are out here, I think it's key to find the right partners. Do not optimize for valuation, in my view. Optimize for governance, for support, for um, yeah, partners, friends, where they, how they're gonna help, um, and and don't optimize and valuation. You know, it's. Uh, if you get a, a bit lower valuation, but then they're going to be more incentivized to support you because they're going to be more in the money on the exit scenario, right? So um, just, I think, uh, and if, if, if for the companies that raised last year at the crazy high valuations, it's extremely hard to do another fundraise now, right? So you have to be, if you have to think long term here and really find folks and people that you want to hustle and work together every day. Obviously, it was a very large round, $100 million. Like, how do you plan to use that money? Well, I was currently just on the balance sheet, but sort of yeah. what, what were your plans for that round? Yeah, uh, we, we were making fun that, uh, at the office that we can now throw a good party. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, in the reality, um, yeah, I think markets are going to be very interesting. And uh, we'll see how the shift is happening in the next six to nine months. But I think uh, yeah, investments uh, investments stopped, and I've spoke here with multiple um, uh, investors, and I'd say the average deal size that they've done already this year was like maybe one two deals uh, in a year when it was you know ten ten a, ten a month or something or five a month. So um, and there are interesting opportunities in the market, and if there are some companies that have some run rates left uh, for for the next you know six to nine months, and it's a, it's all good with these companies, but then. Um, maybe if we combine, you know, forces, or if we, if we buy some company w together with synergies, we can make even bigger businesses. So I see lots of opportunities in that, and I think for founders here, you can be very, uh, you have to, you know, look uh, carefully. But it might be that the acquisition costs go, go, will go down because even the big tech firms will start, you know, reducing their marketing budgets. And there is a good saying, uh, I think, in um, in, uh, in in Formula One racing, uh, uh, Ayrton Senna, the famous driver, said that you cannot uh, take a, a kind of a, you cannot pass ten cars when it's uh, sunshine when sun is shining. You can only do that when it's heavy rain. It's raining heavily. So I think now it's really opportunities and, and where, what you can do. And so much movement in AI and in, in, even in Web3 and other things that we can definitely um, look. And it's going to be very, very interesting time. And um, we'll see. We'll see. And really, many companies will come out stronger. Lots of good companies are going to come out as, as well here. Obviously, you've grown a unicorn with 
very tight capital controls. Do you have any lessons or tips you can share with <coughs> founders or investors here about growing a company with these constraints and what you've described as a very tough environment to raise? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I don't know uh, uh, what's you know better to bootstrap or to raise because we've done only one side of of of, uh, of the equation and. Uh, um, neither, you know, what's good or bad, right or wrong, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was our gig. We started it uh, early. We started it out of a small country. Um, we didn't hire, you know, expensive people in in New York or or or, or San Francisco, and we continue to do that. Um, I think we also started a premium product. We immediately found the product market fit, and I think the advice is really to focus on product market fit. It's very hard to raise especially in this environment, uh, in early stage before product market fit. Because, um, you know, investors want to see the traction in the revenue, and if you get that, it's going to be way, way easier. So immediately you get out of the door, you know, you fi try to find those first revenues, and then you'll see the traction and you'll see a really good, uh, you know, opportunity from uh, the markets and the investors. And also, we've, you know, what we did, we started with the premium product. So we immediately started selling, and again, customers were our, and are our main investors that we focus on. And I think it became a very, Mickey told this a bit earlier in the stage as well, that uh, um, it shouldn't be a job of startups fundraising or founders, right? It should be a job of creating something, of disrupting some industry, of solving a problem, and not, you know, fundraising shouldn't be a goal, right? It's just a step how to create a really great product and, uh, on a mission. So focus on mission, you know, have that uh, uh, set and written and believe in it. It has to be very ambitious and, you know, work about the products, talk to your, cu talk to your customers, uh, iterate, and then I think the investment and everything, you know, is going to happen automatically. All the good companies now, you know, it doesn't matter. The markets, I wouldn't focus on the markets evaluations, especially in early stage. Uh, I think where it matters in, in growth stages or pre-APO, where the pricing is important. In early stage now, you know, still investors going to be looking out. And if you have the product market fit early, if things, you know, are working and if you're creating a great product and you're talking with your customers, you're going to do the fundraise no matter what. So, and try to, you know, fundraise at the beginning very little. Don't delude yourselves. It's a big opportunity and don't get, you know, uh, out lots of equity at the beginning. You're going to, you know, <laughs> you'll have time to do it later. <laughs> but uh, keep it to yourself as much as you can and then, you know, try bit and a bit. So, these are my advices and uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't fundraise, but if you can, you know, stay as long as you can, bootstrap, solo. And, and um, yeah, and that, that's going to happen just automatically. <laughs> Very good. Now, to place devil's advocate, if you were to start a new business today, would you bootstrap this? Or would you, when would you look to raise? Yeah, uh, again, it, you know, hard to say. It depends on what uh, capital intensiveness uh, you would have. Um, we've, been, we've been a big fan of bootstrapping. And I definitely, what I would do, I would, um, you know, and what we're doing now, you know, as well with other our uh, kind of a brands internal, internal like NordPass, Nordlock or others. So if I start a new startup now, I would definitely um, uh, start getting some, you know, traction revenue um, as as quickly as possible. Find that product market fit, good, great numbers, and then depends what kind of a capital intensiveness you need, right? But uh, if you are in some space where you need so much cash to deploy, definitely we would go and fundraise. But if you are, if you could stay a bit longer, we it's it's good now to you know bypass these couple next two years or something when the markets are a bit volatile. But again, I think in early stage it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you need to raise and onboard the right partners that could support you in future growth, in sales, in network, in connections, I would definitely go for those ones. It doesn't I mean? It's if if you find the right folks, right people, the right friends. You have to do it. If not, then do it you know, alone. If you know what you're doing, uh, do it. So that's the plan. And uh, we'll see. I mean, but hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it's, uh, it's helpful. Very good. Well, Tom, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your lessons from founding and growing Nord into Lithuania's second unicorn. <laughs> Can you just yeah. maybe an enlightening question? Like, what, what's next for Nord? Yeah, 
yeah, you know, we have big ambitions, so we'll see if we continue to focus on our mission and uh, driving forward, and uh, um, we continue to serve our customers. I know there are some people using it here in North, so thank you, big thank you for that. We're very open for any feedback, uh, so reach me out either on Twitter or, or whatever, Instagram or uh, email, um, you know, for anything that, uh, that I can be helpful. Really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, we'll see what the world brings us uh, next year. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Round of applause for Tom. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Good? Thank you.